The startup ecosystem is going through one of its worst times. Sharp valuation markdowns. You've seen what's happened with Tiger Global's portfolio. SoftBank's top boss, Massa, while declaring earnings, has said this year the number of investments are likely to halve, if not fall, to a quarter. It's also the season of mass layoffs. There is now a greater emphasis that is being laid on profitability. I'm going to be discussing this and more and the future of EdTech as the world reopens and normalizes post-COVID with uh, Rani Skruwala. He's, of course, uh, donning a new entrepreneurial hat when it comes to Upgrad. Uh, Mr. Skruwala, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Startup Central. You know, you're one of the best people to talk to out there because uh, I know you don't like the phrase serial entrepreneur, but you have had the opportunity and the privilege and the good fortune of having built up many companies in the past. So you've seen many, many cycles. What do you make of the cycle that we are going through at the moment? The tech world falling out of love with investors uh, as investors press the sell button and all the bad news that we keep getting. I think uh, totally, totally overrated, totally over-dramatized. Uh, you'll have a few Maverick investors. I think you mentioned in the introductory comments on one Japanese investor having there. And, you know, they've been resilient. They've done well across the board. Today, I think uh, everyone's misread a situation. Yes, there is definitely, it was, there was so much hype and hoopla that there was some sanity and correction that would need to be there. You know, we have another uh, venture capital firm, which is a global one, that took out a 58, uh, 54 page presentation on what they defined as the, their winter. And I'm wondering where this season is, where they are. So I think, uh, you know, each, and it, it's just shocking because I think if you read that presentation, I'd like to see what their summer presentation is. And I think it sends a very strong and a very wrong signal to founders and entrepreneurs across uh, when you look at them. I think today more than ever, there are many crossroads in the world economy, but there are also incredible opportunities. So I would say to almost 90% of the people that because 10% have had intoxication in valuations, both from private equity side and founders, that is not a generalization of where we are today. Even in the public markets, even in India, we've collected a maximum of 10 to 12%. There's no need to panic. It's still many of the best stocks are at their all time highs. People are making massive investments. India is going to grow at eight plus percent, which is, unprecedented in terms of growth. So I see that there is an incredible amount of opportunity, but it's phenomenal that some sense of correction has happened to the mavericks on both sides of the entrepreneur and founder ecosystem, as well as on the investor ecosystem. So just to take this point forward, so when we look at the NASDAQ, which is, you know, crashed more than 40 percent, or even back home, if you look at the new, the new age li recently listed companies that are trading below their IPO price, at one point falling below 70 percent from the all time high, you're saying this is just a correction, not a bubble to be burst, not a bubble that's waiting to be burst. No, I don't think it's a bubble to be burst. If you look at the NASDAQ, it was heavily indexed on tech stocks. And tech stocks, they're multiples. So it's investors who put a multiple on an, on, a, on an organization. And that is corrected because they now believe that what they thought was going to be a growth for the next 20 years may not be the same picture. And that re-rating of the multiple has led to a very sharp correction when it comes to NASDAQ, which is quite different from most of the other exchanges. Coming back closer to home in India, you look at our stock market, we were at about 60,000 in terms of the Sensex, which is now at 54,000. That's about a 10% correction. But if you look at some of the most interesting companies, they're at their all-time high. So you need to understand, therefore, what's the funnel. That doesn't mean that it's not going to be challenging times because you have a food situation in the world that's going to get even worse. COVID hasn't left the world. There is a war in Europe. There is a threat of a war in East Asia. So those will remain as Mac, but we all know this for the last two years. I think we need to segregate the gloom and doom um, uh, approach, which suddenly makes everyone feel everything is going wrong. Hmm. Well, as they say, right, that um, you can talk yourself into a recession. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to get you out there, because just because you have the pulse of the market as well. And you've seen so many cycles, Mrs. Kruwala. 
But the one thing I do have to ask you, because there will be so many young founders, they may be bootstrapped, they may be funded, there may be many of employees who have left mainstream jobs to follow their dreams, join startups, hoping to make it big. And, you know, it's scary time for them. Look at the headlines of the reading, mass layoffs that are taking place across the startups, startups that were, you know, backed by venture capitalists, throwing money literally, um, and why we were seeing attrition too. What do you make of that and, and the layoffs that we are seeing? So I think you've described that, right? I mean, there are, there are startups that were in, in La La Land and there were money being thrown at them. That's not a normal environment. So I would say to any founder and entrepreneur, this is about as interesting a time to actually in, to invest in or get into or start organizations and companies. It's a very, very interesting time because you're not in now in competition about completely the hubri and the noise that goes around in every other aspect. So I would strongly, strongly recommend to a lot of people, this is an extremely interesting opportunity and an opportune time to actually get in there. When you talk about the mass layoffs, and I know the word mass is subjective, you have one or two companies in the ed tech space that obviously did not have the maturity to anticipate. They were thrown a lot of money. There was a lot of intoxication in the valuations. They defocused. They wanted to go all over the place. And now they take cut and paste mantras from other private equity uh, presentations, which in itself, in my opinion, uh, are not the best ones for, for people to take away. So I think there is that courtier uh, and there's a sense of immaturity. And as you said, uh, companies need to go through multiple seasons. You know, and I thought the word winter, which seems to be a label almost patented by private equity investors, they define their own summer and then they define their own winter. And that actually is the most confusing part to founders and entrepreneurs. And to them, I'd say, stay with your vision and your conviction, because anyway, that's what people are investing into, on your clarity and conviction of reason, and not about you borrowing four pages from a 54-page presentation of, a, of one fund that will say, oh, you know, yesterday you should have done this, but today now you should do that. For those, uh, he's not taking days with this through Allah, but I can, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell my viewers what it is that he's referring to. Sequoia Capital, a few days ago, came out with a 52-slide long presentation telling its uh, founders it is time to look at the bottom line to obsess with profitability. Soon thereafter, we did see a Sequoia portfolio company, a unicorn, an academy. We told you about this just yesterday, ladies and gentlemen, with the co-founder and CEO, Gaurav Munjal, writing to all employees saying winter is here. And to survive the winter, they need to generate free cash flows and obsess about profitability. So, Ron Estruwala, let me ask you this. And you've been around for so long, doing dhanda for so long. Aren't entrepreneurs always supposed to look at the bottom line? Aren't they always supposed to look at profit? Is the era behind us of you know burning cash to onboard customers and you know saying growth at all costs? Um, you know, respectfully to everyone whose name you mentioned there, I think it was a very very immature. I, I read some of the statements. It was immature. It was immature. These companies need to grow up in life. Is what I would bluntly state. And for the private equity funds making such presentations, personally, I think that presentation was meant for their LPs and their investors to make them look good, that look, we're telling all our companies to behave themselves. Actually, the founders and entrepreneurs have misread that to, to, as a message to them. And I think it's respectfully double standards. I would urge a lot of people not to take those kind of presentations seriously, because if you'd seen, as I said, the same presentation as the same companies that would egg you into a different manner. And now they feel, uh, you know, they're the gospel according to St. Matthew. So I have scant regard and respect for that. Uh, I think it's misguiding. It's not great for the entrepreneurial ecosystem when you have these kind of recommendations. And I think some of the behaviors and outbursts from some, uh, some of the founders that says, I'm now focused on profitability. I think everyone has a smile on their face. I don't think they're getting any respect for it. So once again, I ask you this, Mrs. Krivala, because uh, just going through your journey, when you started Upgrad, how did you balance hyper growth and the road to profitability? There's no such thing as hyper growth. You grow as for the market and you grow as for how you want to grow with that. Second, our discipline was for the first five years, we did not raise any private equity. We went out there and we got a lot of questions and we realized people are not going to understand the space. 
So we decided that. So I think our discipline that we got in at the early stages have allowed us to grow. This market, I don't think in the field of edtech in the last hundred years are we seeing such incredible opportunities as we are seeing now. And that is really the opportunity for the next 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years. And a country like India is even better placed. So anyone having a problem today uh, actually is misplaced because the opportunity is mind-blowing. And that's what we are in. Hyper growth is a very subjective word because it normally means that you get into a growth mode to please the investor for a next round. The absolute worst way in which to build a company. Yeah. In fact, it reminds me of what uh, Mr. Sanjeev Bikchandani of InfoAgenda has been saying all along. Don't focus on investors. They will chase you. You have to chase your customers. If the customers come, the investors will follow. And Mr. Skruwala, that seems to be the strategy you also followed. If you're saying you were bootstrapped for five years and you didn't raise any funds, that means the company lived within its means and grew with the market. Yes, yes. I, I dare say we didn't bootstrap. We, we were blessed enough to have our own resources. We put our money where our mouth is. But, um, but we didn't need, and I agree with you, I think the mantra that everyone needs to follow here is, the irony is that private equity investors, or at least most of them, come in to invest in the conviction and vision of the founder. Unfortunately, 90% of the founders try and mold their vision and conviction to please the investor. So it's one little merry-go-round that goes round and round, and that is the unfortunate part. But today, serious businesses, businesses that are built to outlast, will get funding anytime, any day. India is the place to be, right? If the chief investors are not going to invest in China, if they're not going to invest in Russia, just by elimination, a lot of that capital should be coming to India. So, Mrs. Skruwala, once again, what do you make of, I know you've said you don't believe in the summer and the winter-like phases, but when these founders are also telling their employees that funding is going to be difficult for 12 to 18 to 24 months, the sense I'm getting is that you don't believe that the good ones will still get funded. I think they need to learn how to run a business first. I think they need to learn how to run a company because capital is normally fourth out of fifth ranking of importance. There is so much more in terms of your business, your product, your technology, your customer engagement, the culture you build in an organization. The, there's so much in building a business. And if you think capital is the be all and end all, then it's the tail wagging the dog. Please reconstitute and re recalibrate how you run your business. Today, more than ever, we're going to have to find leaders that actually believe that the winters of what they call it are actually opportunities. When you enter a winter phase, predators come out. When you enter a winter phase, from that point of view, it is not for the faint hearted or the weak hearted. So if you haven't figured out how to build a company or grow a company, recalibrate yourself on that, but don't let uh, put out such a strong media message that spooks so many other people when they're actually going about their business in a very correct manner. Fair point. So can I also now ask you, Mr. Skriwal, and once again, just leaning back on your journey, how you start a business, scale it up, and what also must notice is how you exit a business. So now as the world normalizes, and yes, I take your point, there's a war on Russia, Ukraine, geopolitical tensions that we're seeing in Southeast Asia as well. How committed right now is Ronnie Skruwala to Upgrad? Is it time for Ronnie Skruwala to press the exit button? Look, I think uh, uh, it humors me because I want to tell you that in media, I'm one of the few entrepreneurs that stuck it out for the longest. So I was in media for 20 years. 400 entrepreneurs started up in media when I started up. Almost 380 of them either packed up and went out the back. After 20 years when I exited, that does not mean, I think I took a long-term view in media much more than most other people. And I'm here for the next 15 to 20 years to do what I want to do in education in that same manner. Obviously at 20x and 30x, the impact and the scale of what I did in media. So there are no shortcuts on this and businesses are not built to exit at all. Okay, so you will stay committed to upgrad uh, for the next 15, 20 years is what you're saying. Um, Mrs. Kruala, how do you see EdTech shaping up? Because just the way the landscape is. Now, you are 
you know, you've been very clear that why should someone's education only end at school or college? It's supposed, you're supposed to be learning every single day. Uh, you have to keep reinventing yourself. But the way the landscape is, so there are folks like you and Upgrad, then you've got a Baiju, which many say is behaving like a private equity investor, you know, the way it has been doing m and activity. You've got the test prep guys, which is unacademy. You've got the K-12 guys, like the Vedantu and the Eruditus. Are you expecting consolidation? Are you expecting so many players to continue and so many of them which are also now commanding a billion dollar plus valuations? Yes, I think there is scope for everyone. We need to break this up into the K-12 segment, which everyone got fascinated with, which got overfunded, at least I call it overfunded. Some people may think rightfully funded uh, and who had a hockey stick during COVID and that's going through a massive correction. The K-12 sector is the one sector that I'm not in, not because I don't like it, I think it's great, but to be honest, it's a lot of fluff in there. And real outcomes and real impact is measured in higher education. Today, from a college learner to a working professional, I think everyone accepts the fact that what you learned just in school or college or your undergrad or your postgraduate degree is not going to see you the next 20 years of your career in life. And that is the market. That is why we are having what is an absolute revolution in reskilling, not just in India, but in Indonesia and Vietnam and all the way into the United States. And I think the global order is also going to be defined in terms of the top economies in the world, what they do with their workforce, how they train their workforce, how ready are they for being in the part of the fourth industrial revolution. So would you be also on the hunt now? Because as we see markdowns and what you said, founders and VCs living in La La Land, there are opportunities for you now. Absolutely. I can't think of a more better time to be in business than right now. And I'm so happy that a few niche people uh, in their own hobby consider this to be the winter. Uh, and I want to be the snow leopard that comes out in winter and is a predator. I love that. You're going to be the snow leopard that's going to come out hunting in uh, winter. Mrs. Krubala, by when can we expect your first kill? Yeah, it's not a kill. You go out there and actually you can be quite docile. If you just go there, the point of coming out is to show strength. And then you align with people. You collaborate with people. Not everything is about the kill. Now, coming to Upgrad specifically, um, what are the plans going forward? You know, you've, you've done large fundraises. You've also relied on inorganic growth. You've talked about overseas expansion as well. What is the immediate focus, especially at a time when you're saying this is the opportunity to grow when others are going to be conserving cash? I think two aspects. One is, firstly, our overriding and overarching vision has always been that we want to be the lifelong learning partner for everyone from college learners all the way to the age of 50 and 60, uh, and for them to come repeatedly to us in the geography of the entire world. Number two, I do believe there'll be about four or five or six global edtech companies in the next five years. All the seats are vacant right now, but I think one or two will definitely come out of India and Asia. So we want to be in that, and we've thrown a hat to the ring on that. The third part is, I've learned in my media days that if you only do it in a certain vertical, you're never going to get scale and you can't build a brand. And I think the beauty of our brand and the, and the brand connect that we've done without spending the Brazilian amount of money that the K-12 sector has spent by being on cricket tournaments around the world and in India is really from the customer and your outcomes and what you necessarily do there. So I think we're very committed to that for the long haul. Education is not something where you need to throw money and capital. Education, and the last one I would say is there is a fair amount of people, phenomenal entrepreneurs and founders that have come and reached their own glass ceiling in the ed tech space around the world. And I think we have the wherewithal to be able to bring them into the upgrad family, consolidate them as we grow the entire business. Okay, so that's uh, Ronnie Screwwater for you, ladies and gentlemen of Upgrad. There is no winter, there is no summer. It's a great time to do business. There are a lot of opportunities. Founders just need to leave La La Land. Venture capital firms need to leave La La Land and uh, focus on doing business and show maturity. That seems to be the big theme that's out from this interview. Thank you so much for being so candid with Thanks. us. Thank you.